So I would like to continue. So we have just looked at smart metering systems. I told you a little bit about background for smart meters. And uh, this was the last slide where we had looked at what actually a typical smart metering device is sending out every 15 minutes. Um, let me go to the presentation mode again. So uh, the question is, what kind of communication do we have? If we talk about smart metering systems, there can be or may be just one-way communication. That would be not very intelligent metering system. Actually, we wouldn't call that a smart meter system if it's just reading of the data. Usually, it's two-way communication. Uh, we can get information about, uh, for example, time-varying prices. This is not done currently in our uh, system, but it will come. This is obvious that it will come at some time, like time-of-use tariffs. Uh, and then certainly providing data about energy consumption, that's the other direction. And uh, then you could also receive not just tariff information, but also plus further um, all kinds of data, may, maybe some, um, some kinds of incentives or commands or whatever is necessary there for uh, home energy management systems. Uh, so this is the question, what is the scenario in-house, in, inside the house, inside the house, it's of interest to have the information at a, at a fine uh, time grain, as I said, in, uh, for example, um, one hertz resolution, whereas in, oh, for the grid, you only need 15 minutes resolution. You don't need that fine-grained resolution. And how is the data transferred? There are many different approaches for that, many different requirements. Like, as I said, ENBW, with that smart metering system, they just send it using uh, the DSL router. So it's sent over a DSL line uh, to the counter, like using uh, IP packets to EMBW, to the cockpit software. Um, it could also be sent just by using telephone lines. As I said, DSL, you could use mobile communication, like GSM or uh, the most powerful LTE. Um, who of you doesn't know what LTE stands for? You don't know. Long-term evolution. Now, if I would... This is something which is really strange. Like long-term evolution, what does this have to do with mobile communication? But it's just the name. LTE is standing for long-term evolution, so it's, uh, that's the highest level uh, communication standard in the moment, and it's just for long term. Uh, so it's, it provides the highest uh, bandwidth. Uh, there are local area networks. You can certainly also just uh, use local area networks to transmit the information if that's uh, reaching the next layer or, or, or the, the recipient of the data, or just by power line communications. At Mannheim, for example, uh, city quarters have been equipped with power line communication, and uh, so there they, act, they also use power line communication for reading smart meter data. Here, normally, this is not done uh, because it's not that, or considered to be not that reliable. But um, there are many different ideas about that. Uh, the Stadtwerke Karlsruhe, they emphasize that they have to do something with mobile communication, and they're actually developing their own standard for, uh, like, their own protocol for uh, communicating with the metering devices. Um, you can argue about whether that is actually necessary, but they really want to do that because then nobody else can actually interfere with that. At least that's what they hope, that only they will then use that protocol but uh, if somebody wants to interfere with that protocol, they will certainly find ways to do that. And so I'm always very reserved about uh, saying that we just use our own private channels and then we are safe from attacks because attacks usually come from insiders and uh, so it's not the solution. But this is what some people just prefer. 
Okay. Benefits of smart meters, I mentioned several of them already. So for the electric utility, the benefit is that if they get access to precise load data of the connected households, which is a benefit. Uh, you have better operational planning of power plants. It's much better than having just the H0 profiles. But for example, currently the balancing group managers are uh, forced to make their estimates based on H0 profiles, standard profiles. Uh, that's what uh, the regulations say. They have to plan the energy consumption or the, 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 the load for the next day based on the number of households they have and just the household profiles. And uh, so they cannot really utilize uh, more, more exact power readings. Uh, but it, there's the, op the option to do that. Upgrading the information, uh, like off the information by the standard load profile, so the H0 profile is just not exact anymore, and so it's better to, it, it would be better to have precise data. Um, <clears throat> to have decentralized monitoring of the grid state, we have talked about that many times, but here it says monitoring of the grid's state. This is actually something different. You have your, uh, maybe your uh, grid segment with all the end consumers, and then you have certain components. You have your substation, and you can monitor also what's happening on the substation. If you measure what's going on on all these endpoints, you might also notice that at some point there is some, maybe some cable which is uh, having problems. So you may notice faults in the, in the cables. Uh, if, you monitor, if, if you have information about what's actually re uh, uh, consumed in all these households here, if you just add that and you look at how much power is actually used from that or on that cable, if that's a difference, something must be wrong there. And so you, actually you get information, more information about the current status of your power grid and that's a benefit. Uh, so you can have proactive maintenance. You prevent faults from occurring so you don't have blackouts, but you can repair in time, and then this leads to significant cost reduction for your maintenance. You can reduce energy theft. That is the Italian example, and you have reduction of energy of reading costs. That's uh, the Swedish example. They also, you could add if somebody moves out of an apartment and a new tenant moves in, uh, change of ownership of the device or, or, or change of uh, contractors. This is done very easily if you have uh, remote control of the uh, connection to that house. So there are benefits for electric utility. There are benefits for the customer. You can get more information on the energy demand uh, the cost that your energy consumption actually uh, leads to. You need to see the own, can see your own energy supply, and so to have more information is a benefit. You can also analyze the energy demand, so you can, um, uh, you can just look at, like with the Stromradar, look around in your house and uh, just notice, oh, still there's some power being consumed, and you don't know which device is actually doing that. Then you can try to find out, or you just want to know how much power does a certain uh, device actually need. You just switch it on, and you see on your Stromradar exactly uh, what the power profile of that device is. So it is a definite benefit if you can visualize the current energy consumption. Um, then visualization of tariff information, that's obviously a benefit if you see how much you have to pay, time varying, and so you can get incentives to shift the load to, ha to have flexible demand. So the benefits are there, we just have to utilize them. And uh, then what is the difference between smart meters and smart homes? Just by having a smart meter, you don't have a smart home. The smart meter just looks at what's happening in the house. The smart home would actually control what's going on in the house. 
So we have home automation. We need a controller box, some kind of control to do something in the house actively. So the controller box could receive signals. I mentioned price signals or these priority signals. The radio uh, example from the energy utility, so uh, uh, power constraint signals and things like that. So uh, it controls the appliances, scheduling regarding the energy tariffs. So you could have control signals coming from a demand side manager. And uh, then for that, you would need more than the smart meter. You need the controller box. And also to control the decentralized energy supply, uh, this is also done by the local energy system in a smart home. And also just control the demand, appliances, suppliers, storages in the smart home. This is done by some local energy management system, or you could say a controller box for the smart home. So this is the difference. Smart meters are nice, but they don't really make your house intelligent. It's just providing more information. But if you want to utilize that to do more with your demand and your supply locally, you need more. You need an energy management system and or this kind of controller box. Now let's look at a typical load profile. This diagram is a very famous load profile from some, uh, some publication um, from the year 2010. And this has been used in many presentations. I've seen it many uh, or, or very often. What do we see here? I just, when, when I showed you my power consumption from the, on the, the energy cockpit, it was similar. Here it is at, at a more fine-grained resolution, like what I showed you before was just at 15 minutes or even hourly resolution on that energy cockpit information or, or, or that display. Here it is fine-grained resolution. And so what we see is that all the time there is a um, regular pattern, which is the typical pattern of a refrigerator. So what you see there that's typical. You have a peak in the beginning when the compressor starts, and then you have a short period of time where, where the, the fridge is being cooled down, and uh, then uh, it stops. The, frid uh, the, the fridge is getting warmer again, and it has to restart. If you would just monitor the power consumption of a fridge, you can actually see some kind of activities in the house. You see activities in the morning, in the evening, at lunch, because the doors of the fridge are opened and closed again once, twice, several times. Uh, new material, like if you have bought something, you put it in, has to be cooled down. So all these activities can be noticed just by looking at the fridge uh, consumption patterns. Interesting to see that. And um, so that's the, the overnight period where you more or less only have the refrigerator, which is curtain, certainly something which is g going on all the time. If you have that pattern, and now you would like to see the remaining patterns, you could actually just subtract that pattern from the profile and then get a better view on the remaining profiles. So here in the morning, there's something which is... Um, like around getting ready to leave. So take a shower. Maybe you have uh, uh, electric heating of your, uh, of your water. So then you need extra power for having hot water for the shower. You might have, uh, like for, for breakfast, you have to use some power and so on. So this is just showing uh, some power consumption in the morning. Then you have here a water heater again, which is also being used several times during the day, depending on the need for warm water. So overnight, there was no need for warm water, but here in the morning, it was switched on. And uh, so in the evening, you see there's dinner, there are showers, make, having showers more in the morning and the evening. Um, maybe you do your laundry, uh, you're working on the computer or watching TV, having your lights on, you can see all this from such a power profile. Actually, if you have a fine resolution power profile, 
Some people claim that they have been able to find out which TV program has been uh, looked at. This is always, like, people refer to that quite often as uh, showing that it is uh, very, uh, really very um, intrusive if you, if you find out all these things, if you can actually monitor what kind of TV programs people look at. But this is something which is hard to actually repeat. It depended on a specific type of TV set, not, uh, not our LED type TVs, where they have different, like, specific power consumption depending on the kind of movie you see. Yeah, and then you can actually get uh, or, or look at that pattern and find out it must have been that program. Yes, but as you can see here easily from such a fine-grained power profile, you can find out quite a bit of things about the daily habits of the person living there. And so this is of concern with respect to privacy. And we have to be aware of that and deal with that. Okay. Um, then here we have a footprint of certain usage patterns for certain devices. This is measured, has been measured in the KIT Energy Smart Home uh, during a living period there, so you could see exactly how often the washing machine has been used. That's over a few weeks. And uh, you see, so that's the times where the washing machine has been used, the dryer. So usually the dryer just after the washing machine. Then we have the hair dryer. We have the light in the bath, the light in the center, the boiler, the, like the, the water boiler. We have a coffee machine there. They didn't drink that much coffee, really. Um, we have a toaster. They have eaten lots of toasts. Uh, the cooktop, they did not really make their own meals there. Yeah? They had the oven, also they did not really use the oven very much. They have a dishwasher, they use that quite often, or they, they use the TV the most often. Uh, then there's the light in the sleeping room, sleeping room one, sleeping room two. So if you have more detailed information, certainly you can find out even more about what people are doing. So just what it's showing, what kind of things can we do with the data that we have uh, from metering systems in a house. And now you could say, okay, I don't want to actually provide uh, real-time data or one hertz data, but I just provide 15-minute readings or maybe only hourly readings. Now, even from these... Uh, uh, smaller granularities, like every 15 minutes or every hour, uh, what you still can find out is quite a bit. So your uh, employer would like to know whether you were home uh, during your sick leave. You can easily find out. that you don't, you don't need hourly readings for that. You just have to look at how much power consumption you had so if somebody claimed to have been sick at home and you notice by looking at the power consumption of that house, of that apartment, that uh, there is the power consumption of the day when nobody is there, then nobody was there. Maybe you have slept during the complete day, then maybe it looks as if you have not been there, but that's unlikely. So you can control that. Uh, you can find out whether somebody actually was uh, asleep so if there are no power events for at least six hours, this person did not get up, make, switch the light on and do something else, read something or so, so you can see that. Did you watch the game last night? You can see appliance activities matching the TV program. Yeah, so if you know that was the program at that time and you can notice certain consumption patterns related to the program on the TV, you can just uh, get information about that or guess information from this uh, information on how other devices have been used. Or did you leave late for work? Um, so 
uh, you could look at how long it takes to actually drive from home to work. And if the last power event in the house was um, later than the Google Maps estimated travel time, obviously you have uh, left your home later than intended. So you are responsible for, Bill, for being late and not the traffic jam. And so um, to just see this would be ki types of questions to control what people have been doing. And uh, just to show what, uh, what kinds of questions could be asked just by looking at energy data. And the granularity here, as I said, hour, but even several hours would be sufficient. It's not, you don't need uh, detailed information. Whether you get got a good night's sleep, hourly readings completely sufficient. And uh, also uh, here, whether you watched a certain game, for that you need minute data or even uh, higher resolution. And here, if, whether you left late for work, their minute readings would be good. So one kind of question could be, how much data do I want actually to provide to the outside world? And uh, what does it mean with respect to the type of questions that can be asked about my uh, behavioral patterns? So if I don't want to provide information of what I have been doing at home, I should use or I should send data only at a very at, 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 uh, re resolution of hours or something like that. If I don't mind, I can send something at minute resolution or even smaller resolution or no higher resolution than, uh, than minutes, even seconds. But you should be aware of that. That's the major point. And in a topic which is very closely related to that is uh, the so-called uh, non-intrusive appliance load monitoring, or NAUM, NIAUM. Non-intrusive appliance load monitoring. What do you do there? Exactly what we just did on when we looked at this uh, uh, load profile. You just look at the aggregated signal. You see what the, the aggregated power consumption is in your house. And you would like to find out which devices have been used at which time. But you don't want to install extra sensors for that because that's expensive. You just have the smart metering data, and from the smart metering data, you would like to find out at what times did you use which appliances, at what times did you use your washing machine, and so on. And so this is one area of research of the question. Yeah? yeah. You mean this, uh, this footprint here? This is just... The next slide. This is, ex this is done by, by uh, special sensors. So there, like in the smart home on KIT campus, every uh, interesting point in the house network is uh, measured. So there we have complete information. But if you don't want to have that, if you just have your smart metering system, then, like if you just have this here, as I said, you see immediately that, that this is a fridge. And so you can take that out from the profile and look at what's remaining. Do I see certain patterns? So a pattern, for example, like uh, this. This usually is a, a dishwasher. And uh, there are typical patterns of certain devices um, which you can easily detect. And then you can... If, if you detect that, you just subtract that from the profile, and gradually you get more and more patterns that you can actually find out. So this is the problem of non-intrusive appliance load monitoring. And um, so um, some people actually get very active in doing exactly this, and just by looking at the measured power profile of a house, they find out certain characteristics of, uh, like they say, okay, this is a one-person household, this is a two-person household, 
this is just elderly people, this is somebody who is unemployed, things like that. They can find out these patterns from, or these, these classifications just from looking at power profiles. And now the or certain companies certainly are interested in having that information. For example, the utility company, like this is an example that uh, recently a colleague told us in, 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 in a talk. He said there's this example that uh, a company would like, a marketing, or would like to make a marketing campaign on uh, who would be willing to opt for a new tariff with, several, with certain features or just some, some product. Would like to, they want to make a marketing campaign. Now, if you know something about the type of household that, that uh, you have seen there, you can make a much more directed, more specified marketing campaign. And he reported on that uh, the company who used the, that classification all of a sudden had a much higher success rate for the marketing campaigns that they made because they had very specific um, group of people that they approached and before they only had a random selection of people. They didn't have the information that they have now by using that classification. So that's a reason why certain companies are very interested in getting that information about load profiles because then they can classify people. So, um, so this can be used, as I said, for marketing. Now, you have a question. Uh, do you know what method they use? Did they just use machine learning? Just some machine learning methods. They, they, they looked at different methods. They compared different methods. And uh, they're using a good method for that. But they also had a training Yes. Yes. They yes. Oh, yes. Definitely. Yes. They did all that. And but if you look at that, that so many companies now are interested in getting all the information, why should we actually give them that information? So if they have, have a uh, uh, benefit, a commercial benefit or financial benefit from looking at our data, then we could offer to provide our data, but only if they pay for that. Why should I provide them with valuable data if data becomes so, so uh, valuable and we are the owners of the data, the creators of the data, we could make uh, or get some benefit from, being, uh, uh, from agreeing to actually provide the data. And they should pay, it, pay us for that. And not just take the data and uh, even let us pay for the smart meter device. Okay, so... Now the question is, how can we address this problem here of uh, privacy concerns with information and communication technology? What can we do to hide the information, to make that more anonymous? Can we modify the data? How can we do that for high-frequency data? We should make sure that it cannot be attributed to a specific house. So if it is not connected anymore to a specific house, then what I said here with the marketing doesn't work anymore. So bad for those people. Um, without negatively affecting network operations, certainly uh, a certain amount of data is necessary for the distribution system operator to provide his functions in a much better way. And uh, so we have to find ways of allowing the distribution system operator to perform his tasks, to get the information, but they shouldn't know anything about who is actually providing that information and what kind of information. And um, so this is one point. Another point is uh, we can use cryptography, just encrypt the data, not just anonymize, but encrypt, although you have to be aware that certainly if you send, like if here you send, you are the person who is actually using data or using energy, you have your smart metering device, this is sent to some company, uh, and even if that is encrypted, then you know it's impossible to actually access the data, nobody else can use that, 
But here it has to be decrypted again, and then they have full access on that data or to that data. And so in cri cryptography is not uh, a way of providing anonymity for the use of, of for low profiles. It's only making sure that on or while the data is transmitted, um, nobody else can get access. Only those who have the right to decrypt can get access, so you need some trust that they won't do anything bad with your data. And for that, you use signatures, hashing, and encryption. So signatures means you have to hash and to encrypt. I will briefly also go into that technology, but uh, not exactly right now, but after a few more slides. And I would like to start with a simple idea uh, to yeah, make or to hide the information or to, to modify the information that you send to the smart uh, or to, to, the, uh, di to the distribution system operator, to the DSO. So here is your house, here is your household. You have your smart metering system and you send your load profile. This is the load profile here. And you send that to the smart metering, uh, to the distribution system operator, not to the metering system operator. And um, so that institution there gets all the data. And now the question is whether you trust the energy provider or the distribution system operator. So it is private data, and so it's, we should, have, should be able to make that uh, or to do something about that. So you can definitely, as I said, or as we looked at, you can notice from that data uh, how long you have been outside the house, how many people are there, whether you have air conditioning. You can notice at which times you have been outside the house, like on vacation, if certain people know that nobody is in the house, they might use, use that. Typical example, I once heard a talk by a vice president of IBM, and he said that it would be a very nice idea to use the web uh, just to indicate on every house, like on Google Maps, indicate uh, the current power consumption of a house. And uh, he was very surprised when I asked him with respect to the privacy concerns because he didn't see that, that's, that privacy concerns are there. He also did not see the uh, concerns about security of a house. Uh, he only saw that th this might be a nice or give uh, or open a competitive effect, because then people could compete in having less power consumption than the neighbor. Yeah, so this is uh, a different culture. We wouldn't do that in Germany. So, now we want to do this, this smart metering in a slightly different way. So, uh, the balancing group manager of, or electricity provider needs information about the load profile. But he only needs the information from a group of households. He would like to know how much energy has been consumed in the balancing group. Now, balancing group may be a uh, virtual balancing group, not only uh, households that are connected on the same segment on the low voltage grid. So it would not be a, a solution to just get the power consumption from the substation, but you would like to have the aggregated power consumption. Now, the power consumption in every minute is something like... Um, or yeah, power, power consumption is some uh, PI. Now, you could actually split this value into different values. So if you provide a value of uh, 15, you could say, okay, that's 8 plus 7, or 8 plus 10 minus, uh, uh, minus 5. Uh, no, minus, minus, minus three. This is, this is 15. So you can, could just split that into different values. Then you have values Pij. And then you would have the power consumption, Pi, of a specific, like in some time uh, unit. 
you have the power consumption PI of the, of the household number I. You have these different values. And, well, this, uh, the sum of these PIJ is PI. But you could some way split these values between neighboring households. And one is sending this value P, another one is sending P prime, another one P uh, double prime, or appropriate combinations of that. And how that can be done, I will show you on the next slide. The requirement is that if I add up all the information that is sent from this group of households, the sum of all the profiles that are sent should be correct. But the group of households here cooperates in some way to achieve an effect that the profiles that they send are different from their own profiles that are modified. So that's called obfuscation. It's modified. But if you add up all the modifications, they cancel out. This is the major idea. And for that, you need some cooperation. And I will show you how that is actually done. So we can work without violating the privacy, at least for this scenario, where you only are interested in the aggregated power consumption. So this is a protocol, uh, so-called Smart ER protocol, designed by Zoran Finster, who was working in the group of Martina Zitterbart here at KIT. And uh, so this is actually based on a protocol which was called SMART. And then he extended that with uh, aspects of exactness and robustness, robustness against failures and robustness against malicious attacks. I will not go into all those uh, details, only the basic idea I will show you. So the major idea is that you have groups of consumers and, well, initially they would send all the data, or well, that would be one, one possibility. Now you split them into groups. And uh, in those groups, you cooperate to calculate masked readings, where the sum of the readings, the sum of the profiles is correct, but the individual profile looks different. And again, on the next slide, you will see how that works. So... Here we have households A, B, and C. Now, household A is generating a random value, value 12. And this value 12, household A sends to household B and stores it, stores it as minus 12. So uh, household A will calculate a value M, which will be the metering value that will be sent to the, to the distribution system operator or the balancing group manager. Now, uh, he also wants to store the communication partners. So he makes up a list. So, uh, so far we have B in that. Then B and C also send information. They also generate random values, two and four. And they send two and four to M and to A. And locally, they will store minus two and here, oops, minus four. And now here we had minus 12. We add two and four, so now we have minus six. And we have communicated with B and C. And then we have the metering value. The metering value is seven. This is added to the sum of the received values or the generated values in this group. So the, the value that is actually sent now is the value 1. This is sent to the balancing group manager and the list of other members is also sent. And this actually is something which would not be completely necessary because if you add up the values that are sent, since like the 12 was used by A and sent to B, 
And so, uh, it, but it was used as minus 12 locally and as 12 with B, and so this value will cancel out. The same is true for the 2 and 4, which were sent to A. So C and B will modify their values by minus 2 and minus 4, and A modifies it by 6. And then they all add their real consumption values. And so what the uh, balancing group manager actually gets is a profile which looks completely different from what the original profile looked like. But if he adds up all the values, then it is exactly the correct sum. And now this operation with the lists of members and so on, this has to do with the robustness and additional uh, safety properties, which I don't want to go into now. But it just shows that there are simple ways of providing anonymity or not anonymity, like the balancing group manager knows who is actually sending the data, but it's data that is uh, not uh, providing information on what's happened, what happened in the house. Privacy is protected here. So the private information is kept inside, and to the outside you show something which is different from the correct private information. And so this is a very simple way. You just have to add or generate add and subtract a few values, but you have to cooperate. So this is uh, the protocol here for the, the smart ER protocol. And then there's another concern, which might look a little bit strange. At first sight, privacy-preserving energy visualization. This is something my PhD student, Kevin Bao, is actually working on or has been working on. What is this? Uh, doing. There's one rule that, like if you talk about privacy, it means that your private behavior should not be disclosed to others. Now, inside a house, you may be present for some times, like here, for example, you have certain times where you have been present, and in between, you have not been present. Now, in principle, you only have the right to see the detailed uh, power profile or the load profile at the times where you have been present, because there, you, at those times, you know exactly you knew exactly what was going on. But at the time where you have not been in there, you should not know exactly what the load profile was, because then, because then you would know what other people in the house have been doing while you have not been at home. So this is something preventing interfamiliar surveillance. Yeah, you don't want to make, let other people watch, even if they belong to the house, if they have not been there, they should not have a right to monitor what's been going on. So I can all the time just watch, look at my smartphone, look at the power profile, even if I'm not at home, I can see exactly whether my wife has been there uh, at noon or not. Yeah? or somebody has been there. Even if I have not been there, I can see that. But this is not privacy-preserving. And so this is some method of actually detecting whether somebody is present in a house. And so if you want to get the uh, load profile visualized, uh, then at those times where you have not been there, you just see some flat profile, some average profile, and not the detailed power consumption that was actually there at that time. So this is just showing another way of protecting privacy, uh, and uh, like it's to prevent surveillance of fellow inhabitants. And uh, for that, certainly you have to know who actually is present at certain um, in, in certain times. This actually, like if you transfer this to a building scenario, an office building scenario, uh, your boss should not be able to see exactly what in all the different offices has been uh, used, uh, like what kind of energy has been used, because from that your boss can see what you have been doing during the day. You should only see some 
average power consumption, not the detailed power consumption. So if you have an office building and you would like to see what in all the indiv individual offices has been going on, only those who are actually inside that room should see the exact pattern, but the others should not see that. So this has to do with privacy pr uh, protection in different scenarios at home, but also in office buildings. This can be a topic. Okay. And now we have this, these requirements with respect to the smart metering protection profile. So our uh, Federal Office for Information Security, the Bundesamt für Sicherheit in der Informationstechnik, uh, has set out this protection profile for the gateway of a smart metering system. Here is the link on uh, that profile. You can look it up. There are actually updates for that. Uh, this is in a problem that they announced quite some time ago that they will write an update. And so if you are considering to develop a product which conforms with the protection profile, you will wait for the update because you wouldn't really design a product which only has the current profile if you know that in a quite short time frame this will be invalid. And this is another obstacle towards the rollout of smart metering systems in Germany. So it defines security objectives and corresponding requirements for a gateway, which is the only central communication uh, component of that metering system. It has to protect, uh, or it has to provide confidentiality, um, authenticity, only those who are, uh, who actually are allowed to access something get access, integrity of data, and t data should not be modified. This certainly is also an important topic. If you have a time-varying tariff, you would like to modify the data that is sent to the power company such that uh, you are only charged for the time periods where it's very, very uh, cheap. Yeah? So you should not, or it should be noticeable if data is modified. So you also need information flow control. The objectives are to provide or to protect privacy of consumers and to ensure a reliable billing process. So both parties should be, uh, should be protected. The privacy of the consumers and those who are doing the billing should know that they actually are doing that on reliable data. That's why we need integrity of data. And then they have to protect the smart metering system and the infrastructure of the, the smart grid. But it is not actually specifying exactly the system architecture that is necessary, but only the security requirements. And we will look now into those requirements, or first of all into the very general architecture, the very general setting. This is not the, actually an architecture of the system, but it's only showing the global structure. So what do we have here in this protection profile? We have s networks, uh, we have a wide area network, in the wide area network we have the energy provider, we have some authorized external entity which may communicate with the gateway, but only authorized external entities, others should not get access. We have the security module, that is actually the gateway. And it can also communicate with devices inside the house. That's the home area network. And we have the local meteorological network. That's the LMN. Meteorological network means all the, the network of all the metering systems that are connected to that smart meter gateway may be that you have several uh, smart meters. I showed you this example of our s configuration in the, uh, in the House of Living Labs where we had uh, six or seven smart metering systems. And so you could say the, here we have six or seven metering systems and they all connect to one gateway, one secure gateway. And so this, they, they are in this very protected local meteorological network. 
like metering network. Here the names are given again, wide area network, local meteorological network, that's uh, the, the in-house data communication network, interconnecting meteorological equipment only, and this has to be separated, physically separated from the home area network. Uh, so it should not be just uh, wireless communication because that would not be separated from a home area network. The home area network can, can be just some um, wireless network. And then we have controllable local systems inside the home area network, which can also communicate, send data, and like your appliances and uh, like intelligent household appliances or also your air conditioner or your PV cells. Like uh, your PV cells are of interest if the power supply is just too excessive, then if you have just a problem because of too much power supply, the distribution system operator might need to switch off your PV cells, so that would be a controllable local system then, or at least the inverter of the PV cells has to be switched off. Okay, so, the, so we have the gateway. That was this central device. It collects processes and stores records from the meters. It does not do any energy management. Energy management is out of scope here. There may be some devices, but uh, the energy management must be done by some device, but it's not inside that gateway. It ensures that only authorized parties have access to this data. This is an important point, that like the data is sent through that gateway, and only authorized parties may request to have access. There must be some authorization protocol. Information will be signed and encrypted using the services of a security module. I don't know whether you, whether you know what a signature is. I will, uh, in a moment after this, I will show you how we can actually do that, how we can encrypt, how we can uh, provide signatures. I'll give you a brief introduction to um, cryptography in a moment. Um, so, this, here we can sign and encrypt, and it means that we can make sure that the recipient of the data uh, can only decrypt if he has knowledge of the secret information that is necessary to decrypt, and he can check whether the data actually is correct and whether it actually came from the uh, entity that was supposed to be the center of that data. Okay, then we have the metering system. The meter, it records the consumption of production in defined intervals. We have looked at that. It submits signed records to the gateway, so the meter already has to sign the data. Unless the transmission is physically protected. So maybe meter and gateway are inside the same box then the metering system does not have to sign the record that is sent to the gateway because it's inside a box. There's no possibility to interfere. But if the metering system is somewhere at some distance of, well, several meters, some other room in the house, then you have to protect the data, you have to sign the data, make sure that you can notice whether something is modified or not. Uh, so, usually, uh, or this can be done using wired or optical connection. And then the metering system, like, it supports encryption of its connection to the gateway. So, on this line from the gateway to the local, or, or in this local meteorological network, uh, the communication over the lines there can be encrypted. So, even if you get access to the information there, you only can decrypt it if you are authorized to decrypt if you have the secret information. And then you have the security module, which actually uh, uses uh, certain methods for encrypting. So it is a cryptographic service provider. It has, to st it, 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 uh, has uh, secret keys, provides asymmetric cryptography, that means public key cryptography, 
and it's able to generate random numbers, which is also important for certain protocols in cryptography. So this is the different modules there, and they cooperate then in a reasonable way, and uh, they have to deal with a number of threats that you have to be aware of. So now the specification of this protection profile is that you need those different devices. The communication must be, uh, you must be able to secure that communication, as I just mentioned. And then you have to be able to cope with the following threats. So one threat is that data mo uh, is modified locally. So an attacker tries to modify meter data in order to alter billing relevant or grid status information. So you look at how could an attacker do something? He could alter his information, modify, like change it. He could delete information, just delete the packets from the times where the power consumption is very expensive. Or insert new data, or replay or redirect the information. All this would be attacks, and you have to be able to detect that and prevent that. You have to deal with that threat. That's data modification local in your home area network. Then you have data modification in the wide area network. An attacker from the wide area network may try to modify Again, the meter data, the gateway, the configuration data of controllable systems, or perform a, soft, a, a firmware update of that gateway. Like you must be able to provide firmware updates. You must be able to update the software there. But this must only be possible for those who are authorized to do that. So this is an important topic. Uh, you have to cope with all these fre quite frequent update cycles. You must make sure that only authorized updates are actually um, entered there. Then time modification. A local or wide area network attacker tries to alter the gateway time in order to change the relation between date, time, and measured consumption. As said already, might be of interest to only report times at which it has been less expensive. So, for example, to influence the balance of the next invoice must be prevented. A threat, a threat on the infrastructure. A wide area network attacker might try to obtain control over the gateways, meters, or controllable local systems in order to cause damage to consumers or external entities or the grids. For example, simple example, would like to get control over all the fridges in, it, in the city and let them run synchronously. You wouldn't like to have that effect. And then privacy, the attacker from the outside may try to obtain more detailed information from the gateway than actually required to fulfill the tasks defined by its role. So if the di distribution system operator tries to get more information at a higher resolution than is necessary, this should be prevented. So, so you must have contracts about the amount of data that should be sent or that needs to be sent in order to fulfill a certain task, and only that should be sent and not more. You know that there are many stakeholders who try to get more information, to do exactly this, to obtain more detailed information than is necessary to perform their tasks. If they say, my task is also to, detail, to provide a detailed profile and classification of the customers because I have some, uh, some uh, partner uh, who would like to use that information, then this would be a task that is not relevant here. Yes? So this has to be uh, seen. So this is an example of threats that are specified in this protection profile, there are more threats in there. I did not list all of them, but some which are of some interest. Just to show you what such a protection profile, uh, what kind of topics are addressed in such a protection profile. 
And it does not say how you actually manage to achieve that. It just requires that you must be able to um, prevent those threats, to, to deal with those threats or cope with those threats and make sure that they cannot succeed. So what is the, uh, what is the security functionality of the gateway? It has to handle the metadata. It uses access control profiles. So uh, you can look up more information on that to determine which data shall be sent to which component or external entity. Also, how the meter data must be processed. Which process meter data must be sent in which intervals. Yeah, who gets data at 15-minute intervals? Who gets data at second intervals? So this application of Stromradar gets data every second. The application, the outside application uh, with uh, the energy company only gets it every 15 minutes. And maybe there's some other application which only needs, it every, needs some aggregated information every month. So different requirements. To which component or external entity? Who actually should get your information or this data? And how should you sign that? Most probably you have different types of keys for signing depending on the purpose you have it uh, like of that signature uh, you may have to encrypt but the question is what kind of keys do you use for that which kind of what kind of method do you use for that and then the next question is uh, do you have to pseudonymize the data or do you provide exact data on who is the owner of that data, who is, who is the creator of the data. Like if you have to pseudonymize that, so before I talked about anonymization in, with respect to smart meter data, we would, own, we would uh, definitely prefer to have pseudonymized data because we would like to be able to see a certain sequence of uh, values which come from the same source. Even if we don't know which source that is, we should, make sure, should, make, should be able to make sure that we can uh, actually use the data to build those time series all related to the same source. Otherwise, we wouldn't know anything about profiles. We would just get some consumption data from individual time units, but wouldn't be able to actually associate that in some way to get some um, individual load profiles. So if we don't know where that, that comes from, we just know there is this load profile in this uh, balancing group, for example. So if you pseudonymize, you have to know how to do that. And then the goals are to prevent that the gateway accepts data uh, from or sends data to unauthorized entities. You have to make sure that only the minimum amount of data is sent. So this is one important requirement in the, requirement, in the protection profile, they talk about Datensparsamkeit. So uh, be very restricted on the amount of data. Um, only the minimum amount of data for actually fulfilling the um, tasks. Preserve the integrity of the billing processes that they don't come up with wrong uh, billing data and certainly preserve the integrity of the system components and their configurations. So all this has to be uh, managed, and uh, this is not a simple task. Um, so we have integrity and, and authenticity protection that's done using the security module. So you have to verify, if you get information, if you get some data, you have to verify the authenticity and integrity. And you do that by looking at the signature of that item. And I will show you what a signature is when I go into more details of security issues. So, for example, configuration settings or firmware updates, you must know that this data is coming from exactly the authorized sender of updates. Then, uh, like you could also, when you execute a program, 
check whether the program that you are executing has the right signature, is still correct, and nobody in between has modified the program. So things like that, usually like you have, maybe you have heard about the trusted platform module. This is a module that is meanwhile in most of uh, laptops and uh, small computers where you can do exactly that, check whether programs have uh, or are still unmodified. So you want to apply the authenticity and the integrity protection measures when sending processed metadata. So you have to provide it with signature information and so on, such that the recipient of your data can check whether it has been coming from you and whether it is still correct. So the service provider uh, needs, the, needs some information and uh, so this has to be sent such that the service provider can check whether it is actually coming from the right location. But you have to combine that with authenticity. Yeah, so this is something you don't tell who you are, but uh, you have some pseudonym, and uh, then the service or the recipient of the data can check whether it's all coming from the same pseudonym. Because it wouldn't make sense to have pseudonymized data, and then you send it and sign it with your uh, real name, uh, uh, real name, private uh, key. And then the information flow has to be controlled. So only the gateway or devices in the house area network may establish a connection to an external entity in the wide area network. So um, if that would not be uh, uh, guaranteed, then like if an external entity might establish a connection to the, to the gateway, then you don't know whether that gateway actually is authorized. So you would like to have always the, uh, a situation where the gateway decides whether it will open up a TCP connection, for example, and not the external entity starts the uh, TCP connection. So the gateway can establish connections to devices in the local meteorological network and the home area network. And the meters in the, uh, this local network are only allowed to establish a connection to this gateway and not to other gateways. So they can only report data to one specific gateway. Another question is if, for example, the, uh, the distribution system operator or the uh, balancing group manager would like to get data from a gateway. How can you make sure that a connection is established? I said that only the gateway can establish a connection. Now, the, if currently there is no connection, how can we establish that? For that, we have a wake-up service. So this wake-up service is very important because it allows external parties to wake up the gateway, to trigger it, to consider to establish a connection with the triggering entity. So this is something the gateway offers a wake-up service so some external entity can um, send a message to that wake-up service and identify itself. And if that is an authorized uh, entity, then the gateway will establish a connection. You have a question. Well, here we have our gateway, and here is an external entity. This external entity, if that would be allowed to establish a connection, then you would have a, a data communication back and forth. And uh, so you would, you, you would allow information to get into the gateway. Now, we don't want that. We say that there is a, this wake-up service, and this external entity can ask or can send information to the wake-up service, and then the gateway can look up whether that entity is in the list of authorized external entities. So you have a configuration of the gateway 
where you specify all the authorized external entities uh, which are supposed to be trusted entities where it is safe to open up a connection with. And so after that request to the wake-up service, the gateway will respond with opening a connection to that authorized ex uh, external entity. This is different from this external entity trying to establish a connection by itself because then this might open up a channel for attacks. Do you understand? In principle, you can say if this is an authorized uh, external entity, if that would try to make, to get it a, a connection, uh, that would be allowed. But, it, 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 but uh, if it would be a standard connection, like it first has to establish the connection and then it can identify itself. And so here you have separated the identification. You may access the wake up service. And that checks whether everything is okay and then triggers to open up a connection. So there's a higher level of security. Okay. So wake up service, without the wake up service, this would not work. Because if you only say only the gateway may establish a connection to some outside entity, then no outside entity would ever have a chance to trigger the gateway to do something unless you have that wake-up service. So connections are allowed to pre-configured addresses only. That's what, it, what it's what stated there. And these pre-configured addresses are the authorized external entities which are allowed to communicate, but the connection is established or is initiated uh, by the gateway and not by the external entity. Certainly initiated in the way that they use the wake-up service. And only cryptographically protected connections are possible. You can certainly also specify the degree of, uh, crypt of protection that you would like to get, what kind of cryptographic methods should be used, and things like that. But it must be, uh, like certain standards have to be satisfied, which are acceptable as cryptographically protected connections to make sure that nobody who is unauthorized can just... Uh, access that connection, you just redirect, you just try to redirect the connection and then get all the data even if you are not one of those authorized entities. Yeah? Yes? Only the metering system operator would be allowed to do that because this would be some kind of update of firmware and uh, this uh, must come from authorized entities and uh, so you must agree with the metering system operator that you are allowed uh, to actually, or the gateway administrator, to actually modify the list of uh, authorized external entities. Not, no, no, not always. You have to do, that, like, uh, to do that once, but you have to go via the gateway, yeah? but not via the external metering system operator. Okay. Again, here the wake-up service. I said that this is important um, for times when an instant communication to the gateway is required. Maybe you have an unpredicted load situation, so the DSM sends a signal. It has to do something then this message is uh, signed by uh, the gateway administrator and encrypted for uh, the gateway only. If the signature cannot be verified, this message will be dropped. If the signature is verified successfully, the content is verified and the time, there's a timestamp in there. This also has to be verified because if, you, if somebody else just gets that message and replays it, uh, if it's a replay attack, you have noticed it once and you have recorded the timestamp and you notice that this timestamp is coming again, 
then you discard the message. Uh, if the content cannot be verified, the message will be dropped. Like whatever it means to verify the content, there must be certain requirements that, that, that say this content is adequate or is not adequate. Like, for example, this uh, external entity is in the list of authorized uh, external entities. This would be one kind of verification. If it is not verified, message will be dropped, no feedback, and um, connection to a pre-configured external entity will be... I, right, if it could be verified, like if it's not verified, it will be dropped. If it could be verified, the message will be dropped, and a connection to this pre-configured external entity will be initiated. So the gateway administrator actually can send this, or has to sign this message to the wake-up service. So somebody has to approach the gateway administrator, and then the gateway administrator may send a message to the wake-up service, and uh, actually only the, uh, like there the information will be open up a connection to that external entity, and that will be done afterwards. And uh, so this is the wake-up service. Otherwise, you could not have spontaneous communication. And then you have uh, privacy preserve preservation by encryption and pseudonymization, where pseudonymization is important, definitely, to make sure that nobody can relate your profile to your person, to you personally. Um, and... Encryption is necessary to make sure that nobody who is unauthorized can get access to that data. But the authorized recipient certainly gets that data. Okay. Then we have a few more things on metering. This, this security module, as I said, is not specified in detail, but only the requirements are specified. What kind of threats have to be coped with? What are the rules? And how you do that is up to the designer of that module. And then to get certified this is complying with the protection profile, you have to check whether it actually provides uh, all those functionalities that are required in the protection profile. And um, then there are these access control profiles of the gateway. They determine which data shall be sent to which component or external entity. Yeah, this, but this is obvious that we need that. Um, and this is not completely specified in this protection profile for smart meters, but in other documents of the um, Bundesanstalt für Sicherheit in Informationstechnik. So the access control profiles have to do with the operation of the uh, smart metering gateway and not really with providing the protection against attacks. And like this, I have written, I think, two years ago, but it's still valid. It is still under revision. There will be a new standard. We still don't have it. And uh, so this is an obstacle for having a fast rollout of smart metering systems. And some people say in, in the outside uh, countries and uh, in other nations say we are um, weird about uh, that we are worrying that much about privacy concerns. As I said, in Sweden they don't understand that. Uh, so here everything is very complicated. And uh, this is something one has to think about why we actually are so restrictive with respect to this privacy concern about smart metering data, where at the same time we all use our smartphones or use our now new these, these uh, metering devices that you have around your, your, your hand, which are measuring everything that you are doing. Every step that you are doing, your heartbeat, everything is measured, and you send that all the time to some company in the, in the world. And this is much more uh, related to privacy concerns than smart metering data. But people are very concerned about that, and so we have this standard. But we are making our 
technology much more complex because of that. Yeah, so this is something you have to look at as a trade-off, whether you actually need that, how much do you want to invest in this privacy protection, what is the, risks, uh, what is the risk actually of being observed or of sending that information somewhere and they know something about when you have had your breakfast and your lunch and your dinner. Is it so important? I don't know. But these are concerns that you have to be looking at. Now, we have five more minutes. Um, I will briefly start with now more details on um, security and safety. Because I think it's, since most of you don't have a background in informatics, uh, it's reasonable to tell you a little bit more about this kind of topic. So I will tell you something about classification of risks that we have to look at if we talk about security and safety about security policies, about cryptographic methods. I will not give you a long uh, overview of all the cryptographic methods, but just some information on, the, on some major uh, systems. Uh, digital signatures, public key infrastructures, secure communications. These are the important parts that are needed to actually achieve what was specified in the protection profile, to write a digital signature is an essential part, not just for smart metering, also in many other areas, if you want to do uh, um, reliable, uh, legally binding um, uh, trade or, or commerce over electronic uh, media, you need to be able to write digital signatures and to protect your data. So this is something which is very important, and from that you should learn about typical risks, about, like associated with information processing in general, but mainly in energy applications. Know about standard methodology for minimizing risks in, oh, I still have here e-commerce. It was uh, it's certainly also e-commerce, but it's also in uh, energy applications. Yeah? But we are doing quite a bit of businesses on, of commerce also in the energy area. But, um, okay. And uh, then we could now briefly look at the motivation why we actually, or what kind of things we have to look at. Like if we have our energy, like you know my favorite phrase, the energy information and control network with distributed system intelligence. This is something all of you must know by heart that this is the essential point of doing something in the area of energy informatics to come up with an energy information and control network with distributed system intelligence. Now, that can only be successful if all partners may trust the security and safety of all involved components. Security means, well, I will tell you in a moment, like access protection. Safety means nobody can do some harm or get harmed by using that system. All involved components, there are actors, like all partners may trust of all, uh, the safety of all involved components. The actors are the transmission system operators, distribution system operators, demand side managers, smart meter operators, energy providers, uh, energy warehouse providers, all kinds of actors. End consumers are also actors. Transactions, you communicate, transfer, metering data. So these are typical transactions which occur. And you have all kinds of systems which are used. You have computers, you have communication networks, you have devices, appliances, you have uh, transformers, you have substations. All these sy systems must be safe and secure. So a service or system is secure if it is protected against external risks and attacks. Whereas I would say you should also not just look at external, it, it would be worthwhile to also look at internal risks and attacks. But first of all, we look at the protection against external access. 
should be safe, it should be reliable and dependable, even in the case of external failures. So if your battery fails or if uh, your PV cells don't work, the system should or you should still get some, uh, some kind of service or it, there should be no damage beyond the damage of this single component. Um, so then you would say it is safe. It is safe. An internal failure does not damage the environment. Should be trustworthy. This is something which is also important if you have a system which is operating on your behalf. You have an agent doing all the management of your devices in your house. Um, you would like to know that you can trust it, that it will actually carry out everything uh, complying with your policies that you have specified. So it would be trustworthy if there is sufficient information on its properties, including potential risks. And then we have all kinds of safety and security requirements, and that's we will we'll look at in more detail next week. Not next week, but two weeks from now, as I said. Okay, thank you very much for your attention.